I'm Sohan Fan. I'm the founder of West China Tea here in Austin, Texas. We're Austin's only Asian-owned tea house, and we're also one of the nation's premier importers of farm-direct Chinese tea. I got started pouring tea about 20 years ago now. Uh, I, I'm from Houston. I'm 39 years old, and I grew up drinking Chinese tea because my dad's from Hong Kong, so I'm Chinese American. And so I drank tea my whole life since I was a little bitty baby. Chinese tea, puar, tea guanyin, things like that. But I got into the practice of gongfu cha, this act of pouring tea, when I was in college at UC Santa Cruz back in like 2003. 20 years old, I wasn't old enough to buy alcohol. I got a tea set and I got some tea and I would just drink tea with my family and my friends and my, my girlfriend and friends would come over to study because I was in college and we would serve tea to them and we would just hang out and drink tea all the time and that just became my main social activity. And I was just a tea enthusiast for about, you know, seven years or so uh, before I got a job at a tea house, before I actually delved into professionally pouring tea. Jade Leaves Tea House on Guadalupe Rest in peace, uh, they closed in 2010. Turtle Dragon Acupuncture still exists, they moved, but it was, a, it was part of Turtle Dragon Acupuncture. And it was a little, little tea house, they had some decent Chinese tea. They didn't have anyone doing Gong Fu Cha because it's something you have to be trained in how to do or have experience doing. So I started a Gong Fu Cha program for them. And that's how I kind of started, um, you know, breaking the ice on like developing tea community here in Austin. That was back in 2009. And then in 2010, I moved to China. I moved to Chengdu in the capital of Sichuan province. Spicy food, pandas. And I lived there for about three years. I was doing environmental research because my background is in marine biology. But obviously there's no ocean in Sichuan, but there is fresh water. So I was doing freshwater ecological research. And when I had time off, I would go explore the tea mountains of Sichuan, Yunnan, Guangxi, the southwest of China. I would go around and, and I would explore the different tea mountains and meet tea farmers. I'd already been into tea really, really hardcore for like seven, eight years by the time I moved to China. And all the tea that I tried from farmers in China was just orders of magnitude better than the tea that I'd had in America, even trying to get good tea. I wasn't going buying like bags of Lipton tea from the grocery store. I was getting the nicest tea that I could afford. And the tea that I had in China was just so much better. Even like just cheap, like everyday tea that everyone was drinking. Not trying to start a business, just wanting to buy tea from them and, and, and make friends with them. And uh, when I moved back to Austin in 2012, I brought back some of this tea with me. And I got together with my, my tea friends from before I moved, like my, my Jade Leaves friends, and we just drank it all. It wasn't a lot of tea, it was just what I brought back with me and my luggage. And so we, we drank it all, and then I was out of tea, and I was like, well, I'm not gonna go pay for expensive, inferior, imported American tea like a chump, I'm just gonna import it myself and just message my tea farmer friends and get them to send it to me. So I had them, they're not shipping internationally, right? They don't, they don't, they don't do that. But they, I was like, send it to my old roommate in Chengdu. And he put it in a big box for me and shipped it over. And, and uh, he shipped it over to, uh, to, to America. And then it got sent back to China because you can't just do that. You have to have FDA clearance to import tea, which is an agricultural product. So then I had to get this box back. And some of my friends were like, let me give you 50 bucks. Let me get some tea too. Let me just put some money in the box. It wasn't even like I was selling it to them. They were just helping me pay for shipping. But so my money was in the box, their money was in the box, their tea was in the box, and I needed to get this box back. And so I, I did some research, figured out how to do it, and in order to register with the FDA, a food handling facility with the FDA, you have to be a company. You can't be an individual. And so I, went over to the county court over on Airport Boulevard right there and I filed a DBA as West China Tea Company. And I, was, I wasn't trying to start a business. I was just trying to get this one box and I called it West China Tea because it's like the East India Company. They were the first people to sell tea in the West. So it's kind of planned that. Also, I lived in Western China and back then all my tea was from Western China. So it was just kind of like, whatever, it was a throwaway name. I wasn't trying to start a business. And then, and I was doing medical research at the time. That was my, my day job. So I got this, I started the company, got the box of tea. I was just chilling, drinking the tea. And then the business that I worked for went out of business. The medical consultancy that I worked for folded. It was a startup. And so they went out of business and I was unemployed, but I had a sales and use tax permit and I had some tea 
So I was like, well, maybe I'll be a tea merchant. I'll sell tea. Nobody in Austin was trying to buy tea because nobody knew about it. It wasn't like now where people have kind of an awareness of, of like high quality tea. That's kind of where tea kind of still is in America, and especially, you know, 10 years ago when I started the business. So, uh, you know, this practice, Gong Fu Cha, is an essential part of how they drink tea in China. It's an essential part of my experience of drinking tea. If you get this fancy, expensive tea and you want it to be good, then you need to use these tools to make it well. Otherwise, it's just not gonna come out as good. I started doing tea service at my friend's house. I rented a room at my friend's house slash jewelry studio. Emily Spikeman, Clementine and Company Jewelry. And I just did tea service for free out of her house, out of a room in her house every Tuesday and Friday. And then people would tip me or they would buy tea. You know, it wasn't charging for the service itself. And then it just got more and more popular. And I would go to farmer's markets and sell tea there. I would serve tea at festivals, like, con like music festivals and camping festivals and art openings and whatever. Uh, you know, I uh, was in a little like shared retail space with Wonder Pills Kombucha. That's another Austin brand. Uh, Chaco Sutra Chocolates, Clementine and Company Jewelry, Chris Long Ceramics, a lot of other little Austin businesses. We all share a little shared retail space up on South Congress above Uncommon Objects and back when it used to be there. And then, then I was there for you know a couple months, and then we moved to Spider House because it was just getting more and more popular. More and more people were coming to these tea tastings. We needed more space to do it, so we rented a, a little 200 square foot space underneath a tattoo parlor in the mother-in-law unit in the back of Spider House. And uh, yeah, we just were serving tea there, and we would go serve tea at other people's parties, and people would be like drunk, they'd be tripping, they'd be rolling. We'd be have our little like tea set going on there and people would come and sit down and drink tea with us and they'd be all spun out or whatever, but they would really enjoy getting to like calmly ground down at a party and drink tea. And then we started throwing our own parties. We rented, you know, we rented practice yoga for a night and they don't just throw parties at practice yoga because they got these expensive floors, expensive mirrors, but no one's drinking at our parties. So we threw a, a tea party there called Ultraviolet. It was a black light party, super awesome party. hundred something people came. Went till six in the morning. We were cleaning up in the morning so that they could do yoga. And we were like, well, what would happen if we had our, our big space? You know, the spot at Spider House was 200 square feet. We were like, well, what if we had our own big space where we could produce our own events? And that's when we got this place in 2017, opened this as Guanyin Tea House between 2017 and 2020, and then restructured to, to unite the brand West China Tea, the import company, with the tea house, West China Tea House here in 2020, um, right as the pandemic hit, you know? And yeah, we've been here since 2017. We do events here. We just had a big event last night. We do, uh, like, we'll have dance parties. We'll go late, in, you know, one, two in the morning. We don't have to close because we don't serve alcohol. No one's getting, you know, murdered, killed, driving home or anything like that. It's nice and chill. And yeah, and we just do regular tea service here every day, except for Monday. It's Monday right now, so that's why it's quiet. But uh, yeah, you can just stroll up here sit down it's like a bar uh, you can sit down it's five dollars per pot you sit there for it takes 15 20 minutes to drink a pot of tea and you're sitting with strangers people come in here and spend seven hours in here they'll come in when we open they'll leave when we close and we'll just they'll just be here for seven or eight hours they might leave to go get food and come back we got a membership program when people uh, become members they just pay a monthly fee or a yearly fee instead of paying the per pot price we do all kinds of events dance parties and yoga and meditation classes we do private tea tastings that you can book ahead of time we do self-service and obviously we have all this retail you know all this tea I import this tea. If you pick a bag off the shelf, I know the person who grows it. I know the person who processes it. I know them personally. I don't know them on the internet. I know them in real life. I've had dinner with them, you know what I mean? I know their kids, I know their grandkids. Same with the teaware. We got a bunch of local potters here. We got Mark Jeanin, we got Sarah Resor, Juliana Dumas, Melody Wu. Those are all local potters. Uh, we got a lot of imported artisan teaware from uh, Liangtu Studio, Chengju. Uh, uh, the Le Tao studio in Dehua, so a lot of just beautiful, high-grade, handmade wares that are unique to our space. And yeah, we teach classes, you know, we educate people on Gong Fu Cha and Chinese tea culture. I just taught a class yesterday, um, teaching another one second week, second, week, uh, second Sunday of uh, June. 
And yeah, we've been doing it since 2017 and really just in this mode since 2020 with the new woodwork and the new structure and everything. And yeah, so I mean, the impact of this space, obviously I'm biased because it's my space, it's my whole life. You know, my world revolves around it, but we're a community space. We don't have a lot of community spaces in Western culture. People used to go to church on Sunday. They'd see everybody at church, but we don't, you know, everyone's is a pluralistic society. So we don't have one place where everyone can go and be included. And we, we're, we're what they call a third space. It's not your home and it's not where you work. It's a third space. You go there and just to hang out, socialize and be there, be somewhere that you don't have to be, you're not just going and consuming something and then leaving. You know, you go to a coffee shop or, or a bar or something like that, you're supposed to buy a drink and, you're, and those are places that people hang out, but it's very transactional. You know, you're trying to get a drink and if you're not buying a drink, then you need to get out because you're taking up space. But here, the idea is we want people to hang out, we want people to socialize. People sit at this table and they'll meet people they never met and they'll go hang out somewhere else. You know, they'll, they'll they get together. We've got people who are couples here. We've got couples who have opposed each other here. You know, we do babies and tea on Monday. I've got a two-year-old daughter. So just every Monday, including today, we had a bunch of families here in the Great Hall. Parents bring their babies and, and drink tea. You know, the babies play. We got a bunch of baby gym equipment. The adults drink tea with each other and parents get to socialize. It's not a lot of family friendly spaces like public spaces in America. We can just bring kids and it's cool. It's IHOP, you know, <laughs> but um, yeah. And then just being able to have a place where people can go socialize, gather, and not get drunk, you know, they get tea drunk, but you can drive when you're tea drunk, but be able to gather in a space that's inclusive, it's age inclusive, it's religiously inclusive. You can come here and be an observant Muslim and hang out here. You can't do that at a bar, big deal. That's a big part of it. And also we're, we're one of Austin's not that many Asian owned businesses. We're one of Austin's not that many minority owned businesses. That's, that's getting more and more rare in Austin. And so, yeah, that's another part of the impact we have in the community. So, so what we, you know, how did we end up in this particular spot by I-35 was, is what we found. You know, we had our, our, our realtor uh, friend, Jeffrey Outlaw. He helped us find this place. That's his real name, Jeffrey Outlaw. He helped us find this place and it was what we could afford. And it did what we needed it to do, which is have a space for retail, a little private room for private tea services, and then a big open space where you can have a dance party, where you can have a yoga class and be able to host, you know, dozens and dozens of people at once. And it just happened to be by I-35. I think that that kept the price down for us. You know, it's not, it's a weird shaped building and it was abandoned for two years before we moved in here. It was an illegal gambling parlor before we took it over for, and then they got busted by the cops. Actually, the owner of that place and the cops that busted it have been in here and had tea with me on separate occasions. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, that's, that's and, and it's, you know, it's, it's here, it's not pretty. There's no foot traffic. People who come by, there's a naked guy who walks by like every couple days. There's a guy just straight up naked walking down I-35, but, um, but it's, yeah, we can afford it and it's, does all the stuff we needed to do. You know, the expansion of I-35, the, the, the idea of having to move out of this space because of the expansion of I-35 is, it's annoying, it's frustrating on a lot of levels. One is that we've spent a lot of time in the space and put a lot of effort into building out this space. And you know, we can take what we can take, but we can't take everything. There's, there's work and effort we put into improving this space that is just a sunk cost. The cost of moving, supposedly they're gonna pay us something for the move, but I highly doubt it's gonna be enough to cover all of the payroll, all of the lost business, all of the moving expenses, and all of the build out expenses of the new space. Now, almost, it would have to be like hundreds of thousands of dollars to cover that, you know, and I just don't see the city of Austin shelling out that much for this. Um, yeah, it's frustrating. Also, you know, they're, they're clearing out this side of I-35 and it's a bunch of minority owned businesses. I, that's not a coincidence. Who's on the other side? Condos? They're not going to make those condos move. They're not going to make those, you know, wealthy landowners from California who came in and bought up all this real estate and did all these developments. They're not going to move those guys because they've got lawyers. But we got a bunch of family owned businesses on this side, minority owned, family owned businesses. We got Astra's Ethiopia and they've been there for like 30 something years. You know what I mean? We got uh, Whip In, 
you know, another, uh, uh, you know, South Asian owned business, uh, been there for a long time, Austin institutions, and these people are going to have to pack up and move out. And I don't know where everyone's all going to move to, but I doubt that it's, you know, prices keep getting more and more expensive. Most of us are kind of granddaddied into at least somewhat more reasonable rental rates at these spaces because we've been here for so long. We've been in this space for six years now. Um, and so the expense of the lost business, you know, the months it's going to take to get moved, we're not going to be making money from the space, but we still got to pay our employees. You know, we don't want them to just be homeless because we can't make any money. And uh, the cost of, you know, paying people and paying even our own people to rip everything up, move everything up, pack everything up, move it, and then to build out a new space, find a new space, put down the security deposit, you know, put down first and last month's rent, build out the new space, get it all furnished and decked out, get it inspected, all the stuff that it has to do. It's a huge expense as far as money goes and time goes. And as though business, small business owners didn't already have enough to deal with. This city, this, this current climate is extremely hostile to small businesses. And the city of Austin is extremely hostile to its small businesses. We're what makes Austin what it is. When people like keep Austin weird, they're talking about the little small businesses for, for a lot part, a lot of that, the music venues, the bars, the restaurants. We're what makes Austin weird. We're what makes Austin a place that all these people want to come live, but they don't care about us. They're ready to throw us under the bus every chance they get for people coming in with money from these other states. You know, they don't care about our residents, they don't care about our small businesses. And I-35 expanding is not gonna solve the traffic problem. Everybody knows that. That's just, yeah, you ask any like transportation expert, infrastructure expert, urban development expert, they'll tell you, you don't relieve traffic by widening the, 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 the freeways. You just get more cars on the road, you know? And so, and I'm from Houston, so I know that firsthand. You can have a 12 lane highway and you got 12 lanes of traffic. So yeah, it's frustrating because it's not going to do any good. It's going to do a lot of harm, not just to us, but to Austin's culture in general. And for every, you know, out of, you know, every dozen or so businesses that have to move, how many never relocate? How many never reopen? How many just end up going under? You know, again, losing Austin's culture. We got plenty of uh, you know, chains now. We got plenty of corporate stuff. We got plenty of chains, but we're losing all that distinctive, unique local businesses that really makes Austin what it is. And, um, and it's frustrating because it's not going to do any good. And the people who are making these decisions are just trying to make a, a quick fix to solve what they think is, is going to look optically like they're solving a problem, doing something about a problem and awarding these, these, you know, uh, lucrative contracts probably to their homies, you know, whatever, and pleasing, you know, Elon Musk or whatever, who's going to sell a whole bunch of Teslas because you got a bunch more cars on the road and they're not going to be around to suffer the consequences of their actions. They're not going to be held accountable for the impact that their, their administrative decisions are going to have on the culture and the economy of Austin and the demographics of Austin. Alternatives that I've heard to expanding I-35. Um, I haven't heard a whole lot, you know. Uh, the problem being obviously that there's too much traffic. I think there's a couple things that we can do about that. The best one, the one that I have heard and that I agree with the most is fixing the public transportation in Austin. We don't have public transportation in Austin. We have a hassle. I'd talk to anyone who rides the bus and they'll tell you that it's, it's a joke. Our public transportation is a joke. I lived in China for three years. They got amazing public transportation. You don't need a car or a bike or any kind of vehicle to get around town quickly and cheaply. They run on time and they're everywhere and they're easy. But we don't have any kind of public transportation in Austin to speak of, not, not serious. Not when you compare it to a European city or an Asian city, or even like an American city, somewhere like New York or San Francisco that has good public transportation. We're just way behind. Part of the problem is that Austin is not designed for, to, to have public transportation. It's the way that it's set up isn't really conducive to it. So it's not, that's not lost on me, I understand that. We could set up, you know, ask me, we could set up a rideshare system that is run and administered by the city of Austin. Just like Uber, you get on your phone, you've got an app, you dial up a car, but it's free. Your taxes pay for it. 
and you don't need to own a car. That would get a lot of cars off the road because instead of every car that's sitting there in a parking spot for seven hours while the owner is at work, now you've got a car that's moving around, moving people around for free. You know what else? You wouldn't have any more drunk driving accidents because you wouldn't need to drive your car to the bar and you wouldn't need to drive your car back from the bar. You could just get a free ride, sponsored by the city of Boston, we could get rid of our, most of our buses, that stupid train thing, that I don't, have you ever taken that little train thing? No, I don't know anyone who seriously uses that for transportation. It's basically just like a, a prop, you know? Get rid of that, get rid of the buses, uh, you know, really minimize that. And the cost to, uh, you know, traffic accidents, drunk driving, it would fix the parking issue, it would fix the traffic issue. And instead of Uber and Lyft making all that money, then the, the city of Austin would be employing a bunch of people. You know, it'd solve a whole lot of problems, but that's probably not what they're gonna do. All we've heard from TxDOT, we just, we, we, got a, we got a letter, you know what I mean? And we haven't been given any clarity on how much the compensation is gonna be. We haven't been asked what our costs are gonna be. They haven't asked us what we need at all. They haven't even given us any clarity on what's gonna happen or when. You know, they say 2025. What does that mean? Does that mean this place is gonna to be torn down 2025? Does it mean that freeway is gonna get shut down? Because if the freeway is shut down, we're out of business. It doesn't matter if the building stands. You know, if people can't get here, then there's no way for us to conduct business. Uh, there is, is our 2025, are they gonna start on the other end of the freeway? Are they gonna start right here? There's no clarity around that. There's a bunch of ambiguity and there's a bunch of questions that are just unanswered. It feels like they aren't interested at all in talking to us. And again, if we were those people across the freeway who own all these condos and we had a bunch of expensive lawyers, I imagine that they would be a lot more attentive and a lot more communicative about whatever's going on. But unfortunately, we don't have that kind of capital to, to have a bunch of you know, aggressive lawyers who are gonna press for our interests. It's a privilege to be able to take time off from your work and your life to go deal with something like that. They don't ask you when you're available, do they? No, 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 no. They have not communicated with me at all. We've gotten some letters. No one has been here to talk to us. No one has called me. I haven't even gotten, I think we've maybe gotten like a form email, but we, I, don't, I don't have a person. There's no person representing this initiative that has talked to me and that I'm in communication with. At no point have they asked us what we need. There, is, there has been a public, like you can fill out this form to say how you feel about it. They closed it a couple months ago. You know, it was open briefly. And I don't know, it's a very opaque process. I don't know who's reading those messages. I don't know how many people submitted their, their, their disapproval of the plan because none of that was made public. Or if it was, it wasn't made public in a very public way where I could see it or was conspicuous to me. And maybe I could go out of my way and file some forms and find out. But again, it's a privilege to have the time and bandwidth to deal with something like this, to participate in civic life in any way at all is a privilege that only wealthy people can enjoy. Working people and business owners and parents like myself do not have the free time to do stuff like that. People come from all over the country and all over the world to come to this tea house. There is not another tea house like this in the entire United States of America. We are a destination. People literally come from all over the country to come here. And the city of Austin just has complete disregard for all of the stuff that's like that, all of the stuff that is distinctive, unique. If it's not, you know, Tesla or, you know, some like, you know, famous, you know, uh, restaurant or whatever, maybe they care about some of those, but they really don't, you know, they, they kept the hi, how are you? Uh, mural up, they demolished the whole building around it and they kept this mural up. It's just this like, it's this commodification and this token remnant of what Austin used to be. And the, and you go look at Rainy Street. Rainy Street was cool because there were all these cute little houses on it and now it's just a bunch of new construction, cheap new construction corporate bullshit. And that's all Austin's gonna be because the people who are holding the reins just care about making money right now and they don't care about the consequences. And this city is just gonna be like some other, I'm not gonna make enemies by saying the name of a city right now, right? But it's gonna be like some other, any other city in America where it's just a bunch of parking lots and strip malls and condos and 
You go down to South Congress, it's all corporate now. All the little businesses that made South Congress famous and interesting are gone. You go down to the drag, the, you know, Toy Joy is gone, you know, uh, Veggie Heaven's gone, all this stuff. I wouldn't understand, if I came to Austin now, I'd be like, what are people talking about? What's weird about this place? What's charming about this place? Why do people care about this place at all? It's just like any other city in America. And this is, you know, this is part of what makes Austin weird, unique, provides a community vibe, all these things that people, they're, 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 they're uh, doing at the Barton Springs now. You know what I mean? So yeah, the people who are, are tasked with uh, developing and, and preserving the culture of our city and the, the interests of our city are absolutely just selling it off. They're slicing it up and they're selling it off.